if you start either with man's sense experience, as the empiricists do, or you start with man's mind being the measure of all things, you're still starting with man, and in that sense, you're privileging reason over revelation. Welcome to Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss everything from Reformed theology, cultural issues, and all things seminary. This is episode 73, and I'm your host, Jared Luchabor, Director of Marketing. Thank you for tuning in. With us today is Dr. Alan Strange, Professor of Apologetics and Church History, addressing what he calls the lure of rationalism. As Christians, we're not exempt from this temptation of reason over revelation. It's certainly been on the rise since the Enlightenment, but really it's been with us ever since the Garden. And we need to be careful when playing around with reason and its relationship with divine revelation. Here's Dr. Strange. Well, Jared, it's good to be with you for this uh, opportunity to speak about a few things. And uh, all of our listeners, uh, I greet you all and uh, hope that we have a a good time together here. Uh, I'd like to talk about a few things. First of all, I'd like to talk about what I'm calling the lure, or I suppose you could say the temptation to, the lure of, or the temptation to rationalism. And that might seem to be a little surprising that I would think that we, as Reformed and Presbyterian and all of our good listeners, uh, have such a temptation. But let me um, let me uh, explain that a bit, if I may. Certainly, you could say that the lure of rationalism has been a rather strong one in the West, and of course I mean by the West, the Western world, Europe, and the New World – has been a strong temptation uh, since the Enlightenment, particularly the Enlightenment of the 17th coming into the 18th centuries. Really what marked the Enlightenment uh, in terms of a kind of revolutionary view, it involved a scientific revolution, Uh, it involved a movement from an Aristotelian, uh, an Aristotle, uh, kind of view of things to a Baconian, a, a empiricist view of things from looking at the world uh, and trying to understand it in terms of our sense observations and sense experience. All of that really involves a kind of triumph, you might say, of reason over revelation. Now, we could talk about the continental rationalists. You had per- certain people who were called rationalists, Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, being something of a follower of Plato, was a rationalist, and uh, Leibniz and Spinoza and others followed in that train. And that's often had against the British empiricists, uh, John Locke and uh, Berkeley in Hume. Um, But whether you're a rationalist or an empiricist, if you start either with man's sense experience, as the empiricists do, or you start with man's mind being the measure of all things, you're still starting with man, and in that sense, you're privileging reason over revelation. And I say over revelation because earlier in Europe, particularly as the church came into its own um, after the conversion of Constantine in the earlier church, and then what happened in medieval Europe where Christianity came really to predominate uh, in the discussions. Uh, What happened there was a, a kind of understanding that we know what we know when you talk about epistemology. How do we know what we know? A medievalist would say, well, we know what we know because God has revealed it. And he's revealed everything in nature. On the one hand, we speak of general revelation, or he's revealed particularly his saving truth and very specific things about God as a trinity, 
the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the basis of our salvation, all of these sorts of things are contained in special revelation as that's inscripturated, especially. So you did have coming into, coming out of the Reformation, coming into the period of the Enlightenment, you had this basic conviction that revelation was fundamental to knowing what we know. And that really is going back into certain classical convictions, certain pagan convictions, going back to certain things in the Renaissance, but then particularly in the Enlightenment, which that comes from the German Aufklärung, which as Kant said, Kant used, he's the one who used the term Enlightenment, man's coming of age. So for Kant, this was man's coming of age. And what particularly brought this about, they thought, was the challenge that the new science and all the new philosophies brought to Christianity, as well as the challenge um, that had come because the Christian faith was no longer seen as being the kind of monolith that it was. In 1054, the church had split into East and West, and now with the Reformation, you've got not only the Lutherans uh, in 1555, they're recognized uh, in the uh, Peace of Augsburg a, a century later in 1648. The Calvinists are recognized officially at the Peace of Westphalia. So you have a, you have a burgeoning uh, kind of, in, in Protestantism, a burgeoning development of denominations. So philosophers like Descartes and others are saying, well, you can't simply rely on the church. You, you've, got to, you've got to rely on your own mind. You've got to figure these things out in a measure. And so reason becomes predominant over revelation, which really leaves man with skepticism epistemically. How do we know what we know? Ultimately, this is going to move to particularly with David Hume in terms of his empiricism, his radical empiricism. It moves to the conviction that we really can't know anything for certain. We can only know things contingently. We can only know things probably, which of course uh, has a great impact, obviously, on the religious situation. But I want to say this, this, this has been around since the garden. <laughs> you know, when the, when the enemy of our souls, when the serpent said, yea, hath God said, um, that's an invitation to Adam and Eve to sit in judgment on God's word, not to say, well, God's word, God has given his word. You can eat from the fruit of the trees, all of the fruit of the trees in the garden, except this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat of it, you shall die. And Satan calls that into question, which is an invitation for Adam and Eve to join him in sitting on judgment on God. God is our judge, his word is our judge, but now man turns the tables and he becomes the judge of God's word. And I think that's been a temptation ever since the garden to use his reason what we would say magisterially. Using reason magisterially means our reason sits in judgment on God, sits in judgment on his word, rather than understanding that what comes from God, his word, is to be, we're to reason. God is not irrational. We reason, but we reason within the context of his word, and we call that a ministerial use of the reason, a servant use of reason. But I think we've seen throughout the history of the church this, this there is still this temptation to uh, sit in judgment on God and His Word, or to even develop our doctrine and our understanding of the faith in terms that suits our reason and our, you might say, our ability as creatures to figure everything out. There's a sense in which we don't like the profound mysteries, which really are at the heart of our faith. You know, at the at the heart of Christianity. We understand the, the, the doctrine of the blessed, holy, undivided trinity is central. How is it, though, according to a creaturely use of reason in one respect, that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but they're not three gods, there's only one God? We could say that doesn't add up according to our logic. And a lot of people have said that, and they've, they've rejected the trinity because they can't make sense of it with their minds. But the fact is, the Bible teaches it. So our reason may not figure that out, and we don't believe that what the Bible is teaching is contrary to reason. No, it's not 
irrational or illogical, but we may say it's supralogical, it's translogical. In other words, it's not simply subject to the kind of reasoning that we can bring as a creature. We understand that we don't know the mind of God as only God knows his own mind. We call that the incomprehensibility of God. We can know God. He's revealed himself, but we can't comprehend him. We can't know him as he only knows himself. And because this is true, we can't understand the Trinity with the fullness he does. We can understand it. The Trinity is not irrational. It's not unsensible. But there's a certain approach that you can take where you're sitting in judgment on these things, and you say, well, this just doesn't make sense. The people that come around and knock on our doors, our Jehovah's Witness friends, they tell us that. Mm -hmm. Uh, They come from this kind of position. Other people come from this sort of position. And so we see this throughout the history of the church. We see, for example, in the early church, particularly in the fourth and fifth centuries, we see that there were people, I just mentioned the Jehovah's Witnesses, that's a modern form of an older heresy called Arianism. And Arius was very concerned about what he saw going on in the church, a heresy, and it was a heresy called modalism, which is that God is radically one. The Father and the Son and the Spirit don't exist at the same time as distinct persons. Rather, God is one, and sometimes he puts on the mask of the Father or the hat of the Son or the mask of the Spirit. He can't be all three at the same time. And Arius rightly understood that this is not what the Bible teaches. But then he said, well, the Son must be the highest created being. And the early church said, no, the Son is very God of very God. He's truly God and truly man. And Arius said, well, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. But that's what the Bible teaches. And you can go on through the fourth and fifth centuries and everybody making these errors, whether it's Arius on the one end or all the way on the other end, uh, a man called Eutyches in the fifth century said, well, it doesn't make sense to me that Jesus Christ is really a man. I mean, at the moment of his conception, there was a theoretical instance in which he was a man, but the deity swallowed that up. And so he's really God. And we say, no, he really is a man because that's what the Bible says. So um, we see it in our own world. In the Reformation, for example, uh, coming out of the Reformation, there were our our friends, the remonstrants, those folks in 1610 in the Netherlands, right? Uh, These are the followers of, of Arminius. And the followers of Arminius, they said, well, if God is really sovereign, as the Calvinists were saying, as the Belgic Confession was saying, as the Heidelberg Catechism was saying, if God is, they were taking some issue here with these documents. If God's really sovereign, how is man truly responsible? The answer to that, the short answer, is the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches God is really sovereign and man is really responsible. But we're tempted, the lure of rationalism tempts us to want to put this truth on a kind of procrustean bed and chop off what doesn't make sense to us. So the Arminians were happy to say that man is responsible. He's a meaningful moral agent. He is. But then they said, well, that means God isn't really sovereign. Well, that's not true. He is really sovereign. And one of the responses that we can have, we certainly here at MidAmerica, and I think probably many of our listeners are Calvinists, uh, one of the kind of responses we can have to this is a sort of hyper-Calvinism that wants to smooth things out in the other direction. We don't want to be Arminians. We don't want to be Pelagians. That's even worse. We could call Arminianism a sort of semi-Pelagianism, but we don't want to be either one of those, which really ultimately put man in the driver's seat and remove God from his throne. Uh, Man is, it's all about his free choice. And our our world in which we live likes to, has, has liked to, you know, promote that for some time. Man is free and he makes a free choice. And we know that God is sovereign and we know that man in sin, man is born with a will that is, as Edward said, free to do what he wants, but not what he doesn't want. And the question is, what does man want? Well, man, apart from the work of the Spirit of God, apart from being regenerated, 
doesn't want to follow after God. Man never will follow after God. This is why grace must be irresistible. If grace could be resisted, we would resist it. (laughs) But we don't want to go the other direction that some do. Um, There is something called hyper-Calvinism. There's a high Calvinism that gets debated among us, and that's a bit different than hyper-Calvinism, again, which is debated too. But most would agree that there is such a thing as hyper-Calvinism in which they would say there is not a command, there is not a clear duty on the part of those who are not elect to believe. That's called duty faith. And there's not a real call to those who are not elect to come to Christ, to trust in Christ, and to rest in Christ. But we could speak of it, I think, in bigger terms. I think we can say it's also a misguided Calvinism that would deny common grace in any sense of the word. It's also, I think, a misguided Calvinism that would deny a well-meant offer of the gospel, that there is in God a general benevolence towards all of his creation. Uh, Some like to say, no, he only loves his elect. Well, he has a love for his people that is exclusive to them. That is right. But he also has a love over all of his creation. And there is a general uh, goodwill there. And there are many other aspects. There are many other ways that we can speak about um, um, this. And, And there are some of our churches where just in a practical sense, evangelism is not seen as much of a need or an imperative because we can kind of take just a functional, well, if God wants those people to come to him, he's going to bring it. It's sort of like when William Carey and the Baptist Association back in his day stood up and said, I think we need to take the gospel to India. And the man chairing the meeting said, young man, sit down. If God wants to take the gospel to India, he'll do it without you or without me or without any of us. Well, the answer to that is, of course, God could do that. But that's not the way he works, is it? He works through secondary means. He works through, we speak of means of grace. The Holy Spirit could just work directly in all of our hearts. He could just impress and give us all the grace. He could give us all that we need, but he works through the preaching of the word. He works through the administration of the sacraments. He works through prayer. I'm a Presbyterian, so we like to emphasize that as well. The point being is God uses means, and he uses means in terms of of the world, if if he didn't, I would sort of be out of a job because think of my history classes. If I were to say, you know, what were causes of the Reformation? There's a number of things that you need to talk about when you talk about what secondary causes were in play in the Reformation and in bringing about the Reformation. But a student does not get the score or the credit that he might think he deserves if he is a kind of hyper-Calvinist, and his answer is God brought it about because God brings everything about, right? We understand there are secondary causes. I wrote an article, uh, now it's 20 years ago, called All of Grace, in which I talk about the several senses of salvation, that salvation was decreed. I, I, I'm looking at Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 which sort of sets forth that Trinitarian pattern there, that the Father appointed our salvation. And so we can speak about that decrees, the pactum salutis, the the covenant that God himself had in the persons of the Godhead before the worlds began to ordain our salvation. And then Jesus Christ coming, historia salutis, and living and dying for us and purchasing our salvation. And then ordo salutis, the Holy Spirit applying this to us. And I've noticed that some of our churches tend to tend to stress one of the other. Some churches so stress the decrees, it seems like that swallows up all history and everything's in the decrees. And they want to talk about eternal justification. Well, thankfully, the Westminster Confession says justification isn't eternal. It's something that God applies to us in time. And then some want to focus so, and we focus a lot here, right, in terms of a redemptive historical understanding on the work of Christ. But you can just have an objective outward view of the work of Christ that how does that existentially become ours? Well, it needs to become ours 
through the work of the Holy Spirit, and we have that in Ordo Salutis. But some churches so stress either Historia Salutis or Ordo Salutis. In other words, they stress the Spirit's work that it becomes overly subjectivized. But we don't want a faith that's overly objectivized or overly subjectivized. All of these taking one and lopping off the other are instances of rationalism, the lure of rationalism. We want to not do that. We want to believe that salvation is all of grace, and we can speak of it eternally, we can speak of it historically, we can speak of it existentially, even as we can understand that there's the Trinity, there's the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's not only God's sovereignty, but there's our responsibility. And we want to properly resist the lure of rationalism and instead embrace wholeheartedly what all the scriptures teach. Next time on Roundtable, Dr. Strange takes up this theme of rationalism and extends it into theological false dichotomies, addressing certain doctrines of the church and in that conversation, highlighting the importance of not privileging certain aspects of those doctrines to the exclusion of others. For more episodes, you can find us on our website and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.